Excellent. Well, welcome everyone to concurrent session number one. You are in clinical efficiency in genetics clinics through novel models of care. So if this is not where you're supposed to be, um, go back to the main room and click the other link. Um, but we're happy to have you here today. Um, today we have three speakers during our time. Uh, I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers now and that way there'll be a bit of an easier transition as we move between um, the different presentations. Uh, so our first speaker is Melissa Mazenbacher, and she has held many roles as a genetic counselor, including pediatric clinical genetics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as the University of Florida, where she also co-directed the residency program in genetics. She joined Natera in 2009, where her, her role has expanded to the Director of Clinical Projects, Data, and Content. And currently she focuses on creating new modes and methods of educating patients and providers. And she is going to be talking today about AI and virtual assistants. And then we'll move on to um, our second set of speakers. Um, the first is Carolyn Applegate, and she is a genetic counselor manager at the Johns Hopkins University. McCusick Nathan's Department of Genetic Medicine. She has over 10 years of clinical experience providing genetic counseling in general genetics clinics, as well as specialty clinics, including epigenetics and chromatin disorders, disorders of telomere shortening, hematologic malignancies, and retinal disorders. Prior to coming to Johns Hopkins, Carolyn worked for the State of Maryland's Newborn Screening Follow-Up Program. She is currently on the board of the National Society of Genetic Counselors and is a founding member and current chair of the Public Policy Committee of the Maryland DC Society of Genetic Counselors. And she will be co-presenting with Jen Cedeno, um, who is a genetic assistant at Johns Hopkins University, and she's been there for over 10 years. Jen was the first genetic counselor assistant at Johns Hopkins and paved the way for uh, additional genetic assistant positions over the last few years. The first part of her career was spent in the DNA Diagnostic Laboratory, the university's clinical genetic testing lab. And after 10 years in this position, Jen transitioned into a clinical role within the Institute of Genetic Medicine, where she works with eight genetic counselors and 12 medical geneticists. Uh, and they're going to be talking about genetic, genetic assistance. All right, Melissa, you can take it away. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak this afternoon. And today, I'm going to be talking about the intersection of technology and genetics, which includes many ideas about my vision of the futures for genetic counselors and genetic counseling. Um, as genetic testing has become part of routine medicine and the demands for our services have grown, um, we need to think about new ideas. So this growth has happened for a variety of reasons some of which are the completion of the Human Genome Project, an increase in known genetic conditions, and a decrease in the cost of genetic testing, specifically gene sequencing. The field of genetics is starting to move from generalized medicine to personalized med medicine, and genetic testing is being used not just for diagnostic testing or prenatal screening, but moving towards predictive medicine for common diseases. This shift means more people will use genetic testing, creating a need for new and accessible models for service and education. So here are my disclosures as required by ACMG. Today, I plan to walk through what genetic counselors do, which most of you probably know since the majority of you are genetic counselors or genetic counseling students, um, and how technology can help us do what we do and do more of what we do. We'll talk about the tasks that are AI ready and some studies that have been done both by um, my company and others to examine the use of technology, specifically virtual assistance in genetics. I'll be discussing, as I said, both studies in the literature and my own personal experience with the virtual assistant that I developed at Natera, um, who we call Neva. So before we look forward to what's happening now, let's take a quick look back. So just as genetics has quickly advanced in the later half of the 1900s, so has the profession of genetic counseling. Um, in an NSGC blog post, past president Wendy Ullman recalled that in the early 1980s, clinical geneticists considered themselves to be the genetic counselors, and those with master's degrees, genetics associates. Joan Marks, an early director of Sarah Lawrence, said at the start, many in the medical community had, and I quote, 
serious doubts that non-physician counselors could be trusted to know their limitations and that there was open skepticism that dealing with the emotional component of genetic diseases was either necessary or constructive. So that sounds a little crazy thinking about where we are today. Obviously, genetic counselors had to prove their worth, and we're lucky that they persevered because by the year 2000, genetic counselors were an integral part of genetics clinics, MFM offices, and cancer clinics. We excelled at providing education, assessing risk, explaining test results, helping patients make difficult decisions, and supporting these decisions along with filling out consent forms, dealing with scheduling disasters, managing relationships within the office, and more. So now in 2020, I often find myself realizing that genetic counselors can do all the things. And so what do I mean by that? Well, here we see from the NSGC um, professional survey in 2020, the list of job titles for genetic counselors. Genetic counselors are known as both GCs and MSLs. We're managers, researchers, professors, directors, CEOs, vice presidents, owners of companies, and more. Our roles have also expanded to include not just patient care and education, writing and lab work, but also supervision, management, advocacy, business development, marketing, sales, public policy, with even more roles roles that are not listed here, but I'm sure many of you think about, like where is a foundation board member or an expert consultant for a virtual work environment? Even as our profession has grown and our job titles and responsibilities grow and our numbers grow, although not fast enough as we'll see soon, we're still by training genetic counselors and in a unique position to combine genetics and counseling. So, now onto more of what I'm supposed to be talking about today, which is the intersection of genetic counseling and genetics and technology. And this question, this topic, I think, really looms large for me as one of the questions that I struggle with is how are we going to keep up? Recent studies indicate that with the increasing adoption of genetic testing, healthcare providers, including genetic counselors, will not be able to meet the demand for communicating genetic information to patients. Data from the Genetic Counselor Workforce Working Group, it's, a, it's definitely a tongue twister, um, shows that from 2006 to 2016, the genetic counselor workforce has grown by 88% with an additional growth of 72% projected by 2026. Despite this growth, the data indicate that there will be a shortage of genetic counselors, specifically those engaged in direct patient care. It continues to be clear that there are too few genetics professionals to meet the increased demand for genetic information. This working group concluded that a future goal must be identifying and integrating tools to increase the efficiency and productivity of genetic counselors. Moreover, rapid and full access to laboratory results for patients is being required, increasing the need for rapid and universal test result education. As stated by Dr. Seymour Kessler, a clinical psychologist well known in the genetic counseling community, the demands of the new genetics suggest strongly the need for greater attention to counseling, convey understanding of clients, and helping them be more hopeful and more capable about dealing with their life problems. How quickly and how broadly genomic testing technologies are incorporated into clinical care may depend on our ability to support genetic and education and provide genetic counseling, which as we saw before, is a limited resource. Technology and technological innovations may be one solution to this problem. Incorporating technology into medicine is not new. There are online tools that many of us have used for our entire careers. There are genetic risk assessment calculators, pedigree building softwares, EMRs, telemedicine, video education, just to name a few, have all impacted service, position, service provision across many medical fields, including genetics. A new technological solution, or fairly new, um, are virtual assistants, also referred to as chatbots. These are emerging as a viable option for providing genetic education. Virtual assistants are beginning to be used in healthcare systems, in corporations, and in NIH-funded projects. Well-designed virtual assistants can leverage artificial intelligence, or AI, and conversation-style user experience to connect with patients. They can even go beyond patient education 
to provide services, including result disclosure, answering patient questions, and connecting patients with healthcare providers. So there are many virtual assistants that are being used in healthcare and specifically genetics. Virtual assistants can provide a new way to increase our efficiency, scale our counseling services, and educate more patients, while also creating easily accessible on-demand information. Although multiple companies are developing virtual assistants or chatbots, I'm not an expert in all of them. And so much of this talk, I'm going to focus on Neva, the virtual assistant that I designed and built with our user experience team. Recently, Carity et al. published a paper titled Artificial Intelligence in Genetic Services Delivery, Utopia or Apocalypse? This paper outlined key genetic counseling tasks, including information gathering, establishing or verifying a diagnosis, assessing risk, information giving, psychosocial support, and coordination. The authors then elaborated on which of these tasks and specific pieces of each task a virtual assistant could accomplish. I've used the data from that paper and added some additional tasks to come up with this table here. So virtual assistants can pull data from different sources, both public sites like Google and private ones like EMRs or laboratory management systems. This information can then be used to construct pedigrees, populate consent or, or requisition forms. Some AI tools can predict diagnosis based on phenotypic findings. Years ago, OMIM was the main source of a computer generated differential diagnosis, but now tools are much more sophisticated and include facial recognition software. Various programmed algorithms can be imp implanted to predict a risk and match patients to treatments, clinical trials, support groups, and more. All of this information can then be given to patients or providers using a virtual assistant who have the benefit of never sleeping, being able to hold 100 different conversations at the same time, and, um, um, and being easily accessible um, from anyone's computer. So some virtual assistants can use well-designed questions to detect psychosocial problems or long longitudinal data on mood and assess specific changes seen in one patient. Lastly, virtual assistants are great at doing the same thing over and over and over again, including things like sending appointment reminders, documenting encounters, ordering test kits, and connecting patients to the right humans, both genetic counselors, customer service, billing representatives, or other healthcare providers. So as I mentioned, we'll focus on the virtual assistant I'm most familiar with for most of this talk, Neva. She was created to increase efficiency of genetic counselors, to meet patients where they are, and educate more people, while at the same time allowing genetic counselors more time to focus on more complicated tasks which did include building a virtual assistant and spend time with patients who want to speak with a genetic counselor. First, we designed Neva to work with our carrier test to educate patients about both positive and negative test results. Then we designed her to chat with patients interested in hereditary cancer testing to educate them about this testing and also evaluate their risk level. And lastly, we added another post-test scenario for education about NIPT results. So looking at those three use case scenarios, here are the tasks from that original table by uh, Kearney that Neva can do. I'll go to, into more detail on the next slide, but for our uses, Neva is able to do some tasks in each of these categories, except for establish a diagnosis. There are some chatbots that can be used to predict a diagnosis, specifically those that collect the data for patient wellness assessments in the field of psychology to screen for anxiety or depression. And also wish there was a chatbot to deal with my cat that's banging on the door. So I apologize for that. Looking at this in more detail, for information gathering, Neva is able to connect to our laboratory management system and pull the carrier results for a patient, including both the disease and the gene. Neva then determines if this is a result that she's trained to chat about. Our genetic counselors decided which results they were comfortable with having a virtual assistant discuss and which we felt were best dealt with by a genetic counselor. 
for example, initially a carrier of an X-linked disease was routed to our genetic counseling team, while a carrier of a common CF mutation could chat with NEVA. In this way, our genetic counselors have become more readily available to talk with patients who have more complicated results or those that just choose to speak with a genetic counselor rather than self-serving using the virtual assistant. The second task that NEVA can complete is a risk assessment. For hereditary cancer testing, questions are based on the latest MCCN guidelines, and they were written to provide patients with an elevated or a low risk assessment. Once completed, NEVA switches to the task of information giving and can walk patients through testing options and possible results scenarios. For our carrier screening, NEVA also plays a role in information giving by explaining test results and using some diagrams to help patients understand, as you can see here. After information giving is complete, NEVA can then document the encounter with the patient accomplishing the task of logistics. Lastly, throughout the NEVA chat, um, patients get asked if they understand the information. And if they don't understand the information or just if they choose, NEVA can connect patients with a genetic counselor, allowing the task of offering support to be completed. So now let's switch back to what we see in the literature and how people feel about virtual assistants. A recent paper looking at the acceptability of an AI-led chatbot service in healthcare documented some of the positives of these encounters to be better than Google, an anonymous service, which was noted to be particularly favorable when being used in a mental health care situation, um, increased availability, as we said, virtual assistants are always available, um, and the ability to triage complex cases. The negatives were people felt like they were talking to a robot, they were uncertain about the accuracy or the security of personal information, they had a previously poor user experience with a chatbot, or they felt like there was an inability to have empathy. So we did some similar studies looking at the positive and negative attributes of NEVA for both carrier screening and NIPT. Um, here you can see for carrier screening that over half of the patients who use NEVA chose the positive adjectives of knowledgeable, friendly, helpful, and clear. Negative descriptor descriptors were chosen less than 10% of the time and included not helpful, confusing, too wordy, and distressing. No patient stated that the virtual assistant was too complex, which was something that we were really anxious about. Um, so we felt pretty good about that piece. Overall, 90% of users rated the virtual assistant as either very easy or easy to use and stated that they understood the information that was given to them. We also asked how people felt after using the virtual assistant for carrier screening results. The most common selected adjectives were satisfied, informed, and relieved. Um, while a small percentage of patients did select negative adjectives, including alarmed, confused, or frustrated. When we transitioned to using a virtual assistant to augment our phone genetic information sessions, we did see an increase in patient engagement for patients with positive carrier screening results. And because the virtual assistant was designed to educate patients for both negative and positive results, whereas our traditional model only proactively engaged positive patients, we saw a significant increase in the number of patients that were receiving education about their genetic testing results, which as a genetic counselor, I feel is really important to talk to people or educate people when they have a positive result, but also a negative result and what that means or does not mean for them. So here are the results of the similar studies that we did using the virtual assistant and NIPT. Almost all of this, this, the users, again, rated NEVA as easy or very easy to use. And over half of respondents with previous virtual assistant or chatbot experience rated NEVA as better than other virtual assistants. And no one rated NEVA as worse or much worse, which I also felt pretty good about. Again, we asked uh, patients about their feelings. Most described the chatbot as helpful, easy to understand, or friendly. Some of the other positive adjectives we saw were supportive, trustworthy, compassionate, and reassuring. Um, again, we were trying to get at some of the um, information giving, but also 
was there the ability to feel any sort of empathy from a virtual assistant? Um, only one patient used negative adjectives for our NIPT virtual assistant, but they did choose all of these negative adjectives um, and then also typed in the other negative adjective, which was not necessary. Uh, no patients described the virtual assistant as boring, unhelpful, insensitive, or not trustworthy. The majority of patients did not know their carrier screening or their NIPT results prior to interacting with the virtual assistant. And after interacting with her, over 80% of patients understood their carrier or NIPT results and the additional information that was provided about NIPT screening. A small percentage of patients had questions about their results after the interaction. For all patients, genetic information sessions with board certified genetic counselors were available. Um, and these could be scheduled either using the virtual assistant or using an outside platform. So then to finish up looking back at the literature, um, in this study, participants were asked the overall likelihood of using a virtual assistant for healthcare if it was available in the next year. Only 12% of patients stated they were unlikely to use a virtual assistant for healthcare, while two thirds stated they were, very li they were likely to use a virtual assistant. Interestingly, when participants were broken down into groups based on ethnicity, age, education, gender, and IT literacy, the differences in expected virtual assistant use were really minimal. Surprisingly, non-white individuals were more likely to use an, a virtual assistant. Those over the age of 25 were slightly less likely to use a virtual assistant, but still 80% of individuals were likely to use a virtual assistant regardless of age. The differences based on gender and education were minimal and not surprisingly, were minimal. And then also not surprisingly, when you looked at IT literacy, those who felt that their IT literacy were, was good or moderate say that they were more likely to use a virtual assistant, but still those with rated poor IT literacy, 70% um, still felt like they were likely to use a virtual assistant. So where do we go and, and what does this all mean? In 2019, there was an NSGC blog entry about the usefulness of AI and the future of genetic counseling. It stated that artificial intelligence can collect relevant personal and family history, develop a differential diagnosis, deliver personalized education, and provide a standard plan for medical management. And I think that virtual assistants may be one of the right vehicles for AI and genetics. So in conclusion, with the increased use of genetic testing, more stringent test, test timing requirements for result release, healthcare providers, including genetic counselors, are going to need new ways to educate patients about test results. Virtual assistants can be a useful tool to help meet these needs for result disclosure and result education. Virtual assistants can expand remote access to genetic services in a scalable way. They're available to patients during non-business hours and weekends. Um, and in this way, virtual assistants may be an effective way to address the limitations of genetic counselor availability, triage cases by complexity, reduce some of the wait time barriers that we see, and extend services to more patients. I think there are lots of future studies that still need to be done um, to optimize and expand this new service delivery model. Um, and so next, we're going to have Jen and Carolyn talk about a different type of solution um, that um, leverages genetic counseling assistance or genetic assistance, um, and then including the training of these individuals and how they've been integrated into their various workplaces. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. While Carolyn and Jen get their slides pulled up, I believe we have another poll just looking at what people's experiences have been with genetic assistance or genetic counseling assistance. All is up. All right. Okay, this time we don't have a clear <laughs> answer. 60% of participants who have already answered. Let's give you just a, a few more seconds so everybody has the opportunity to answer. And I'm slowly 
close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and one. All right, sharing the results right now. Okay, so it looks like uh, a lot of folks have never worked with a genetic assistant. Uh, about 34% do, some have in the past, and some of you are hoping to. Great, okay. So I uh, would like to start by thanking uh, NIMAC and the uh, conference committee and session organizers for allowing us the opportunity to talk with you all today. Uh, we're going to talk about genetic assistance and how they increase efficiency of service delivery. You'll note that we have the counseling of genetic counseling assistance in parentheses, and we will discuss the reason for this later in the talk. Okay, there we go. Um, so Carolyn and I do not have any financial disclosures. And Carolyn and I both received compensation for creating and teaching the genetic assistant training course that Carolyn will discuss later in the talk. By the end of this talk, we hope that you'll be able to identify three ways that genetic assistance can increase efficiency in genetics to increase patient access and outcomes. I'm going to start by reviewing the role of the genetic counselor, which uh, given the results of the first uh, poll is probably a little bit uh, unnecessary, um, but just a quick review for those who are not genetic counselors or some folks who may not be familiar with them. Um, Genetic counselors are mid-level healthcare providers who have advanced training in medical genetics and counseling. And after they complete a master's degree in genetic counseling, they're certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling. Uh, Carolyn will provide a more in-depth review of the role of genetic counselors, as did uh, Melissa. So I'm not really going to get into the details of this slide. Genetic assistants typically hold a bachelor's degree in a field such as biology, genetics, or a social science such as psychology. The genetic assistant position may be considered similar to a higher level medical assistant or an office assistant type position. However, we will discuss the differences in these roles shortly. Genetic assistants may be considering a future career as a genetic counselor. And the ultimate goal of the role of the genetic assistant is to increase the amount of time that genetic counselors spend on their certified competencies. So the tier profession model that uh, we're looking at with genetic assistants is uh, not something that is uh, novel to genetics. Um, in the field of physical therapy, for example, physical therapists are supported by physical therapist assistants and physical therapy aides. Physicians may be supported by nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and registered nurses. So just a quick review, genetic counselors have advanced training in medical genetics and counseling and are mid-level healthcare providers. Genetic assistants typically hold a bachelor's degree in biology or genetics and may have a desire for continuing education with plans to apply for genetic counseling training programs. And office assistants typically have administrative experience and they may have experience in a genetic setting. However, office assistants do not usually have a formal education in genetics or biology. Genetic assistants can play a role in many settings, including but not limited to clinics and laboratories. The role of the genetic assistant in each setting will be different, but there will likely be some overlapping tasks. As you can see in this diagram, the tasks performed by a genetic assistant may also have some overlap with the role of an office assistant. However, a genetic assistant would also be expected to carry out tasks requiring a certain degree of understanding of genetics, which is beyond the scope of the office assistant. Some of the tasks are listed here and include uh, preparing paperwork and shipping patient samples, constructing pedigrees and taking basic family histories, preparing letters of medical necessity for patient testing, and formulating results letter based on genetic test results. Uh, genetic assistants may also correspond with patients, genetic counselors, laboratories, and physicians. 
excuse me, and communicate test results. Uh, genetic um, assistance may generate genetic test reports and provide limited results interpretation depending on what those results are. Uh, assistance may participate in quality assurance programs and help resolve sample check-in issues such as those dealing with patient identifiers. I'd like to turn now to two different studies that looked at the role and impacts of genetic assistance working in genetics clinics. The first study was published in 2020 and was conducted at Geisinger Cancer Genetics Clinic, where they reported a 20% increase in referrals from 2014 to 2018. Due to this increased demand for services, they implemented a genetic assistant program with a ratio of 1.5 genetic counselors to 1.3 genetic assistants. Genetic counselors participated in time tracking studies before and after the implementation of the genetic assistant program. The time tasked included pre-appointment duties as well as direct patient care, specifically the time spent by genetic counselors in pre-appointment activities, the length of the appointments, patients per week per genetic counselor, and the estimated clinic cost per patient per week. Of note, the genetic counseling assistance in this scenario did support post-appointment tasks, but the genetic counselor time was not tracked or reported for these activities. The results of this study show that the implementation of the genetic assistant program um, after the implementation, less time was spent on each pre-appointment activity. Appointment length was also shorter without sacrificing services because the genetic assistants were providing pre-appointment support for tasks such as reviewing personal and family histories and creating pedigrees. These tasks would have been conducted by the genetic counselor during the visit before the implementation of the genetic assistant program. Due to the decreased average appointment length, genetic counselors were able to see more patients in the same amount of time and therefore increase the number of patients seen per week. Since the cost of maintaining genetic counselors remained stable and there was increased revenue with increased patient volumes, there was therefore decrease in weekly clinic cost per patient. And of note, um, the increased revenue was expected to offset the cost of adding uh, genetic assistant support. The second study I'd like to review is from 2017 and it involves genetic counselors and genetic assistants who worked at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and the University of San Francisco. It also uh, involved genetic counseling program directors who were contacted via the American Genetic Counseling Program Directors Listserv. In this study, a survey was emailed to individuals who have held a genetic assistant position, genetic counselors who have worked with genetic assistants, program directors who have accepted genetic assistance and those who have not had direct contact with a genetic assistant to date. The aims of the study were to explore the efficiency of the genetic assistant position within the genetic counseling field, evaluate attitudes toward expanding genetic counseling services to include the genetic assistant and to gather data regarding genetic assistant job tasks and endeavors. We won't have time today to discuss the outcomes of the latter two aims of the study, um, but I do want to highlight the increased efficiency noted when uh, genetic counselors reported uh, working with genetic assistants. So 100% of genetic counselors stated that working with a genetic assistant increased their efficiency. And when there was a ratio of three to one genetic counselors to genetic assistants, genetic counselors reported a 60% increase in patient volumes. So three genetic counselors with one genetic assistant were able to conduct the equivalent work of 4.75 genetic counselors without a genetic assistant. So these particular institutions Hiring one genetic assistant was the equivalent of hiring 1.75 genetic counselors at half the cost of hiring one genetic counselor. So 
by now, if you don't already work with a genetic assistant, hopefully you're starting to think about uh, the best way to hire one or more. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Carolyn, uh, so she can discuss genetic assistant training and some observations based on our experience. Thanks, Jen. Can we use this? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you to NIMAC and the session organizers for allowing us to present this information. Um, and thank you to Jen for her wonderful backdrop to this. Um, and now I'm really gonna focus on our online genetic assistant training program. Um, and I promise by the end, we will discuss this terminology of genetic counseling assistant versus genetic assistant. Um, so for some background, our department was approached in about 2018 by the newly formed Office of Online Education with the backing of Johns Hopkins leadership, really wanting to provide some sort of online education in genetics and genomics. And so we identified basically this, this group of people, genetic counseling assistants as a target for educational opportunities, basically for two reasons. One being that we knew that often these individuals that were hired as genetic counseling assistants were people who are interested in going to grad school. And so the turnover in those programs was usually a year, kind of two years at best. And then we also knew that the training was being done by the clinics or by the laboratories themselves and often by the genetic counselors. So even though they were increasing the clinical efficiency, we knew there was sort of this lag um, and, and effort that was needed to actually educate these individuals and get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So with the help of the online um, assistant or the on, Office for Online Education, we developed these two, this program, which is two 10 week long instructor led courses. And so each week students receive recorded lectures and you can see me there. It's a little talking head with our slide um, and it's recorded ahead of time. And they receive that recorded lecture as well as supplemental readings and they have a graded assignment. And the, the lectures and materials and assignments are released weekly, but during that week, it's completely self-paced self and asynchronous. And then we also hold three office hour sessions, which is basically kind of looks like this. Um, come hang out with Jen and I, <laughs> ask any questions that you have about the content or just general professional career questions. And then once the students have passed both courses, um, they receive a certificate of completion. And here are the names of the two courses. So we have Fundamentals of Clinical Genomics, as well as Working as a Genetic Assistant. And we put a lot of effort into organizing these courses and the content so that they could either be taken simultaneously or sequentially. And Fundamentals of Clinical Genomics focuses, at least in the first half, more on like the nuts and bolts and background information. Um, and then we transition to online resources, ethical issues, hot topics in the media and how that might impact patients and providers' perceptions of genetics and genetic testing. And then for working as a genetic assistant, this is more about the practical applications of the skills as well as the laboratory aspects of genetic testing. And so for an example, um, we give students a request from a physician or a genetic counselor to look up what laboratories the um, the desired genetic testing that was specified in that request um, and have them look up what laboratories offer that testing and report back kind of what they think would be the most important things to consider when either choosing a laboratory or a particular assay. So as a quick note, one thing I was super concerned about was whether or not I'd get kicked out of the field of genetic counseling for basically replacing us. <laughs> and so I went to the ABGC practice guideline, practice competencies to see if we could map our curriculum to these practice-based competencies. And essentially what we found is it they, they barely do. Um, so within this domain one, mainly number four, so identifying, assessing, thinking about genetic test ordering, we do train people to do that. But I would say overall, the depth and breadth of the training that we give is not the same as genetic counseling. So we began enrolling students in the summer of 2019. We have three time points throughout the year, so spring, summer, and fall. And up to 2022, we had 176 individuals complete the course, um, and then 12 individuals took just one. 
And we try to cap the course at 25 if it's just Jen and I teaching the classes, because at that point it just gets, it's too much work to, to keep up with. Um, but this, this semester, so spring 2022, we added an additional instructor um, so that we can increase our, the number of students we've taken because we had the demand. So this semester, for instance, I think we have 28 and 30 students per course. And I know this is a tiny slide, but I wanted to include the demographics here. Um, and so you can see that it's still predominantly females that take the course. One thing that I think is important to note that um, regarding self-identified race and ethnicity is that white was listed as 69% um, percent of the time. And if we compare this to the professional status survey for genetic counselors in 2021, 90% of genetic counselors identified as white. So at least we're seeing some increase in diversity to some extent um, within this cohort. The other thing you'll see here is that the vast majority, 67%, had a bachelor's degree of some kind. And this was sort of important to us because we did aim the level of education and the background to be that of someone who had a bachelor's degree, but people have been able to successfully complete the course without having a bachelor's degree. We ask everyone at the beginning, they fill out a survey and that's where all of this information is coming from. And 42% of the students, so just under half, were not planning or were unsure about whether they were going to apply to graduate school for genetic counseling. We also asked whether or not they were currently employed as a genetic assistant. And so about 20% of individuals said yes. And you can see here that they were working in multiple different work settings. So hospitals, laboratories, and medical offices in both clinical and research settings. And we were asking if people wanted to obtain a position as a genetic assistant and about 53% of them said yes. So in some cases that was either people who were planning to go to graduate school and wanted to get a position as a genetic assistant or they were people working and wanted kind of a, a promotion to a position like a genetic assistant. So we knew that not everybody has the actual title of genetic assistant available to them at their institution. And so we also did um, a, a mini study where we just went through students' introductions and broke down whether or not they were working, which 71% of them were, whether or not they were working in healthcare, which the majority of people who were working were working in healthcare. And then we looked at whether or not they were working in genetics and genomics. And in that case, and we, we went kind of very broad. So if you were doing any genetic testing, you got, yes, you were working in genetics and genomics. And so you can see about two thirds of people were, but about a third were not. And I think we're seeing two kind of interesting things in this data. So one, like we aren't surprised, over 50%, just about 50% of people were interested in going to graduate school who were interested in being a genetic assistant or were currently working as a genetic assistant. And the second thing that I think is a little more interesting is that there are a lot of individuals who are already working in healthcare who want to learn more about genetics and genomics and could fill, fulfill this role of genetic assistant. And I think too, our data starts to show that this may be an opportunity to increase the voices of individuals from diverse, at least ancestral backgrounds within the field of genetic and genomics, even though we know we still have a ways to go. And so we made a very conscious choice to call this a genetic assistant training program rather than a genetic counseling assistant training program, because we didn't really feel like the concepts that we were teaching and the work that needs to be done is specific to genetic counseling practice. Rather, it's applicable to any specialty or any doctor's office where they're practicing in the field of genetics and genomics. Um, and so in some cases, it will make more sense for the genetic counselor or the, sorry, the genetic assistant to be working with directly with the physician. And so you can see this in our little model here. So the current literature shows um, that there are certain ways in which genetic assistants can increase efficiency in the clinical realm. Um, but I think additionally, we need to think about some ways that other, or collect data on other ways that genetic assistants can help with um, the field of clinical and medical genetics. So can we decrease wait times? Can we increase patient satisfaction? Um, can we, we know that we can increase genetic counselors job satisfaction, but what about other providers um, and people working in the healthcare system? Can we retain them better and decrease burnout? 
Um, so just to summarize briefly, the main role of genetic assistance is to optimize the role of CGCs, at least as we've traditionally known it, known it, known the position to be. Um, and we can increase the efficiency, patient volumes, and GC job satisfaction. And then the duties in, um, that are required need an understanding of genetics and genetic testing more than the standard office administrative task, but I think these can be taught to people of varying education levels. And so with that, um, we'll just switch to, feel free to email Jen and I if you have any questions about the program, and we'll turn it over to Andrea if there's any questions and if there's time for questions. All right, thank you so much, Jen and Carolyn. Um, we have just about two minutes left. So I know we're gonna put up in the chat here how to get back to the main room. Melissa has been diligently answering your questions via chat. So thank you, Melissa, so much for that. Um, and otherwise, I think we're just gonna give people a couple of minutes unless there's maybe one or two questions for Jen and Carolyn, but I'm not seeing anything in the... Oh, one question for, for you all, since we might not have time to respond in the chat. Um, so Jessica asks, are these students that are interested in or actively applying to genetic counseling programs, um, or are these individuals from other locations and are actively in GCA roles? So I think you talked about GCA roles, but maybe not prospective so students. It's a combination. Um, we did ask, and of course now I'm forgetting the exact data, but there were people who were actively applying to genetic counseling school, especially over the pandemic when there was less shadowing opportunities. Um, but then there were also people who were employed in the GCA role. And we have sort of a, a deal where if an, a laboratory or an institution sends three genetic assistants, they get a discount. Um, so it, it really was a combination of all of the above. That's the only question that I see. I've put the information for the main meeting back in the chat here. And so we will see everyone back over there. Thank you again to our speakers, Melissa and Jen and Carolyn, You what, what wonderful presentations. Um, we'll see you back over in the main room. And if anyone else on the NIMAC team wants to be the spokesperson for what's happening up here on the screen. I'll bring you up here. Now I see some smiles out there. <laughs> so go ahead and unmute yourself if you're uh, trying to get up here. But we see answers coming in. I'll keep pacing the link in chat. I, I heard the... Um my my down the hall mates uh, talk and again I think the genetic assistant um, program here has really helped us enormously um, but I was only in that session and I think that's what people are saying in the um, Mentimeter here and engagement here all right well we do have Alyssa back here too thank Great. you Julianne that was a perfect segue and I am, there's people pouring in from the other session now. So I'm gonna keep putting the link in chat. And Alyssa, you can, are you ready to take the spotlight here? And yeah, you'll unmute yourself. Too. I am ready, yep. I was just changing my name. Oh, you're perfect. Every time I come back, I have to change my name. It's true. All right, so as you guys can see on the screen, we'd really love to share um, some of the really useful things we got from the session that we attended so that the people that chose the other session can maybe pull some of those lessons out. So whichever session you went to, um, share something in uh, this poll that you heard that you think people that attended the other session might benefit from. And this is one of the ones that if you look in the chat, there's a link that you click on um, that brings you to a website where you answer this question. So I'm seeing from the people that went to the other talk that they learned a lot about um, genetic assistance as team members and how that really changes the way that um, clinics flow and that they can see more families that way and that they can be a, an incredible asset to the practice. Um, they also heard over there about virtual assistance and the way that they can uh, similarly impact how many patients can be seen in a genetics clinic, which can be really powerful for everyone because that is a way to increase access to care when we create situations where clinics can see more people, more families in a day than they used to. 
sounds like you discussed in the other room also that generally families are satisfied when they have these encounters with virtual assistants, which is really important to know, because I think for many of us, that would be a, a new idea. So good to know that people are looking at how families feel about that. We certainly had conversations in the telegenetic session about the issues that people are challenged with, with licensure and telehealth and how that can sometimes get in the way of maintaining relationships with uh, providers that you've had for a while, if, if they're not in the state or if you're not in the state that you need to be. GCAs are pulling their weight and then some, I love that, adding a lot to the clinic for sure. All right, guys, thank you for all of that input. So um, really the goal of this last hour that we had together was to learn from innovative ways to deliver care. Um, in the telegenetic session, we talked about ways that telehealth is making it easier for families and for genetics providers as well to make uh, sure that families are getting the services they need, as well as talking about the challenges that still remain um, in using telegenetics. In the novel models of care session, some of our genetics providers talked about how they're doing things in new ways to make more time for more families to be seen during the clinic day, whether that's through the support of emerging technologies like artificial intelligence or new staff members like genetics assistants. So right now, we're gonna give you a little bit of time to share what you learned and what you'll take away from these sessions. Um, as you've experienced over the course of the meeting, in a moment, you're gonna see an invitation um, to join a breakout room. Um, you can choose to accept that invitation and have a really cool small conversation with people um, about what you learned in your session. Um, as Erica has said, if it's not a good time for you to have that conversation or to be on camera, um, you don't have to accept that invitation. And if you want to have a conversation in Spanish, there is a special breakout room for our Spanish speakers. Um, so Erica will share with us the directions on how to go have those conversations. That is exactly right, Alyssa. So I've been busy over here making the rooms and we do have a chat prompt for these cross-pollination discussions. And that is to simply introduce yourself, share which session you attended and what will you take from these sessions back to your own efforts in genetics to help make genetic clinics more, more efficient or more effective or more inclusive. So I'm gonna put that chat prompt in chat here. So we're moving towards the, we're in the final hours at home stretch of the meeting. So really starting to uh, thinking about towards application. How can you take all of this energy, all of these resources, all of these conversations, and how can you bring them into practice? So I will click to open the rooms in just a moment. If you're looking for the Vamos a Charlar en Espanol room, you'll have to scroll down a bit on the menu because it's a little bit, it's gonna be like a treasure hunt for you to scroll down and find that because that all the, um, the rooms are before it. So here you are, there's seven minutes in the rooms. You receive an invitation. As Alyssa said, if you're just not a good time, then just decline the invitation and we'll resume back here in seven minutes. <laughs> 